Hello, my name is Travis Monk. This is one part in a series of videos involving ecology. This video will provide an overview of the community and ecosystem levels of ecology, as well as examples for the concepts that are discussed here. A scientific community can be defined as the interactions or relationships between different species of organisms. An example of these interactions can be observed in the food web diagram exhibited on this slide. The ecosystem level of ecology would include all of the aspects of the community level Plus, it would involve all of the non-living or abiotic factors and the influence they have on these species. All living things need energy. One way that organisms can be classified is by the way that they obtain their energy. Some organisms, generally referred to as autotrophs or producers, make their own food. Most producers use energy from sunlight to do photosynthesis to make that food. Producers are the base of communities and provide, directly or indirectly, all the resources available for other organisms. The amount of photosynthesis that can be done by producers that are present in an ecosystem is called primary productivity. Since more photosynthesis can be done where there is a high temperature and lots of water, the amount of life that can be sustained in a community is determined by the amount of available sunlight and precipitation in an area. The graphic on this slide shows that swamps and rainforests, both hot and wet places, are at the top of the chart for primary productivity, and the tundra and desert, both possessing very little available water, at the bottom. Instead of producing their own food, some organisms called heterotrophs, or consumers, opt to eat other organisms to obtain their energy. There are many different classifications of consumers that are described on the left. Herbivores eat producers, carnivores eat other consumers, Omnivores eat both consumers and producers, and detritivores eat things that are already dead or dying. You may also know them as scavengers. Decomposers are a type of detritivore that break things down on a chemical level. An example of an herbivore might be a cow eating grass, which is a producer. Carnivores, such as lions, eat consumers, such as gazelle, exclusively. Most humans are omnivores, eating a diet of producers, such as lettuce and consumers, such as cows. The vulture in this picture is an example of a detritivore, eating already dead organisms. And bacteria that break things down on a microscopic level would provide an example of decomposers. There are a wide variety of species interactions that have and will be discussed later in this video. Two that you're probably most familiar with are shown and described in this slide. Predators are organisms that capture, kill, or consume others over a very short period of time while prey are organisms that are captured, killed, or consumed. The garter snake in this picture is clearly eating the newt. The snake would be an example of a predator in this scenario, while the newt would be an example of prey. If you wanted to look at the linear feeding relationships between organisms, how energy flows within a community, what organisms are predators and which are prey, you could look at a diagram like the one shown in this slide, which is called a food chain. At the bottom of each food chain, there is a producer, and then you may find a series of consumers, and finally at the top, you would find a detritivore and decomposer. The picture furthest to the left, green plants are the producers and collect energy from the sun. Insects eat the plants, small fish eat the insects, large fish eat the small fish, and hawks eat the large fish. When the top consumers, or potentially any other organisms die, they can be chemically broken down by bacteria. While a food chain may provide a simplistic overview of what eats what in a community, few organisms utilize a single food resource. So a food web is a more realistic way to show all of the complex interactions found within communities. Using spiders in this picture for an example, not only do they eat herbivorous insects and predaceous insects, but predaceous insects and insectivorous birds also eat them. If you were to take a walk in a forest, you would find a wide variety of organisms living there. If you looked at the type of organisms that you found based upon their food source, you may begin to notice that while there are a lot of producers or photosynthesizers, there are fewer herbivores, such as squirrels, that could be classified as primary consumers that eat those producers. It might take even more time to find carnivores or omnivores that could be classified as secondary consumers organisms that eat primary consumers, such as the mouse that eats insects in this picture. You could expect to find very few organisms that are classified as tertiary consumers, which are heterotrophs that eat secondary consumers, 
such as the snake that eats mice in this diagram. The reason that you would find these results is that organisms need to use a lot of energy to maintain homeostasis, or their internal conditions. Only about 10% of the energy that an organism consumes can be utilized to grow and reproduce, to be incorporated into those higher trophic levels. To oversimplify things, if you had 1,000 kilograms of a producer, it could sustain about 100 kilograms of primary consumer, which can then sustain about 10 kilograms of secondary consumer, and finally about 1 kilogram of tertiary consumer, as the graphic on the bottom depicts. The rest of this energy would be used for normal metabolic processes, such as maintaining body temperature. Due to differences in temperature and precipitation in different areas throughout the world, and therefore the primary productivity in these regions, the number and the diversity of species in areas differs significantly. Species diversity, or species richness, describes the number and the variance of organisms that are found there. Species richness or diversity in various parts of the world are shown in the graphic to the right. Areas in red and orange have a very high species richness. Note that most of these locations would contain swamps or rainforests. Areas in blue and green have very low species richness. Many of these areas are in very dry and or very cold locations. One additional factor that plays a role in the species richness or diversity in an area involves the size of the community in study. As exhibited most clearly on islands, the larger the geographic area, the greater the species richness in a community. The graphic on this slide shows five different chains of island that exhibit this pattern clearly. The bigger the area, shown in the x-axis, measured in acres, the larger the number of species, shown on the y-axis. One reason that this concept is important is that the greater the species richness and species diversity in an area, the more stable a community is. If one of the hundreds of thousands of species in a rainforest were to be eliminated from the area, another organism could probably fill its niche, its role in the ecosystem. In a desert area, such as the one that's shown in gray in Australia in the picture of the right, species richness and diversity are so low, one to four, based upon this graphic, that were one organism to be eliminated, it might have considerable consequences on the rest of the ecosystem. Within a community, every organism fills an important role. Some organisms, referred to as keystone species, can be very small in number within a community, but play a ridiculously important role in shaping an ecosystem. The elephant, that's shown in the picture to the right, is an example of such a keystone species. Savannas, described in the video on biomes, are essentially very warm grasslands that are commonly seen in Africa. One major reason that the savannas look the way they do, instead of being forested, is that elephants knock over trees to reach all the tall leaves and to gain access to all the carbohydrate-filled tree roots. If elephants didn't perform their job, the entire landscape would be drastically different. Another example of a species interaction that was described earlier is competition. Since many organisms have overlapping fundamental niches, or the resources that they could possibly utilize in an environment, there is competition or fighting for resources. If two different members of the same species fight with resources with one another, this is referred to as intraspecific competition. When individuals of two different species fight for resources, it's referred to as interspecific competition. To distinguish between the two forms of competition, you could think about college sports. Intramural sports occur within the same college. Intercollegiate sports occur between different colleges. Competition for resources is a lose-lose situation for all individuals involved, so there are some strategies that organisms employ to avoid competition. The picture on the bottom shows an agar petri dish with bacteria and a fungus on it. While the bacteria grow very, very quickly and efficiently, the fungus produces a toxin to prevent bacterial growth. This fungus is of the genus Penicillium, and produces an antibiotic called penicillin that was accidentally discovered when a scientist observed bacterial growth was inhibited on a discarded plate. Instead of competing for a resource, this fungus decided to try to kill off the competition. On the previous slide, where bacteria and a fungus fought for the same resource, one organism is eliminated in a strategy to avoid competition called competitive exclusion. By eliminating the other species through higher efficiency or the production of toxins, one organism can find success. 
Alternatively, competition for resources can be avoided by a technique called resource partitioning. The term partition means to divide into parts, which describes what the organisms do. They split up the resources. Instead of each of the species of bird, shown in this picture, fighting for nesting space throughout the entire tree, illustrated here, as all the birds could potentially live throughout the tree, each species decides to nest in a particular section of the tree and avoid competition with one another. To avoid being captured, killed, or consumed by predators, organisms employ a number of different strategies. As discussed in the video on animal behavior, organisms might form herds. The video on organism ecology suggested that some organisms may migrate to avoid unfavorable conditions if predation reduced the population significantly. Some organisms are cryptically colored to blend into their environment. Organisms such as snakes may produce toxins or, as many of the butterflies shown in the picture to the right, just be distasteful. The survival strategy that's exhibited on this slide is referred to as mimicry. Some toxic or distasteful organisms have colors or color patterns that are easily identifiable to potential predators. Some different toxic and non-toxic organisms have evolved similar color patterns and have avoided predation by doing so. An example of this technique involves the monarch butterfly and viceroy butterfly exhibited on the top of the picture to the right. The monarch is distasteful or poisonous, while the similarly patterned viceroy is not. Birds avoid eating both types of butterflies, however, because it's difficult to tell the two apart. This type of mimicry, where one organism is toxic and the other is not, is called Batesian mimicry. The, the bottom two sets of butterflies exhibit similar patterns of coloration and are all toxic. Predators identify all organisms with this pattern of coloration as toxic, and as a result, they avoid predation. These organisms, all of which are toxic, exhibit Mullerian mimicry. There are three classifications of long-term relationships between different species based upon the impact of that species has upon the other. The first of these three types of relationships is called parasitism. In this type of relationship, one organism benefits while the other organism is negatively impacted, hence the plus minus on the slide. A parasite feeds upon another organism called a host. While this relationship is somewhat similar to predation, Parasitism does not result in the immediate death of its prey. Parasites that live on the outside of an organism are called ectoparasites. Ecto means on the outside. The top picture of a tick would be an excellent example of this type of parasite, as would leeches and lice, all of which live on the outside of the body. In the bottom picture on this slide, Dr. Oz is showing Oprah a tapeworm that can be found in the digestive tract of its host. Since it lives on the inside of an organism, and the prefix endo means inside, it would be referred to as an endoparasite. The prefix sin or sim means united or together, and the term biotic means life. Put the two together and you end up with the term symbiotic, meaning living together. Symbiotic mutualism is similar to parasitism in the sense that it's a long-term relationship between two organisms. Unlike parasitism, however, both organisms benefit, hence the plus-plus describing their relationship on this slide. Examples of symbiotic mutualism involve a bee and a flower, or a human and the bacteria in the human's intestines. Bees help pollinate flowers, while the flowers provide food for the bees. Humans provide bacteria with food, while bacteria provide human with some essential nutrients, such as vitamins. Both examples are win-win. Symbiotic commensalism falls somewhere between mutualism and parasitism. One organism benefits, while the other organism neither benefits nor is negatively affected, hence the plus zero, representing neutral on this slide. An example of commensalism could be shown in the picture to the right involving a bird on a cow's back. While the cow stirs up insects for the bird to eat, the bird does no real harm nor good for this cow in the circumstance. If the bird happened to pick off parasitic insects from the cow's back, however, this might provide an excellent example of symbiotic mutualism. That is the end of this video summarizing the community and ecosystem levels of ecology. If you're interested in learning about any other levels of ecology or any other themes of biology, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you.